Then welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we continue with support vector machines. Okay, so I hope you like the topic. It's slightly different than all this probability stuff. It's more about mathematical optimization. However, let me remind you, um, also the data from a support vector machine comes from a probabilistic model. At least that's how I think about it, okay? So there is some underlying probability distribution. And of course, it's interest, interesting to see, so where is the probability distribution in the support vector machine? And uh, not clear to me where it is. So last time, where were we? We were, that we derived a primal problem for the separable case and also a dual problem for the separable case. Up until now, the dual problem is just curious that you can do, that you can have two different optimization problems. An advantage might be that the constraints might be easier. So the inequality constraints here are simpler than the inequality constraints up here. But it depends on your solver that you are using, whether the primal problem is better or the dual problem. The other thing was that we were only looking at the linear SVM. So we were only looking at some linear transformation of our patterns. Of course, you can use the same trick as in linear regression, right? You can first feed the axis into some basis functions and to get some nonlinear features and then apply an SVM. That you can always do. And that's what we are going to do next time when we talk about nonlinear support vector machines. And when we do that, it turns out that there will be the so called kernel trick which may makes the nonlinear version even nicer. For the nonlinear version, we will, in principle, talk about infinite dimensional W. So the optimization of the W will be really impossible in the primal problem. So for the nonlinear case, we really need the dual problem because there the number of variables corresponds to the number of data points that we have. Okay. Nonetheless, it's first easier to derive it for the separable linear case or the mass instead of doing it for the more complicated nonlinear one. Okay. I think we stopped last time. Um, at these slides where it's explained how to calculate the w's and actually how to get really numbers and to calculate how to calculate the b and again i want to stress so this thing how to calculate the b that is very rarely explained in detail often when you look at books or when you look at papers yeah it's considered okay the w has this expression and you can calculate the b somehow from some other constraints but there are some steps that you need to make. So you need to identify the alpha, which are larger. And then in that case, you can transform this um, complementary slack condition into something useful to calculate the B. Okay, so it's always a bit under the carpet, especially also for the non-separable case, the linear non-separable case that we will look at today. There, this calculation is basically the same, but there are some subtleties, okay, that we will discuss. However, before we get to the non-separable case, let's look how to implement our support vector machine. Okay, so how can we do this? So let's take the dual of a linear support vector machine. Yeah, so this is our optimization problem. And you write it on your piece of paper, right? So far we are on pieces of papers writing down math. And then you just go to the math department to some person knowledgeable about mathematical optimization, and they will give you some solver to solve this. However, maybe you want to do it yourself. So you look at your library, maybe you're using MATLAB or may maybe you're using some other software that has a function called quadproc, okay? And quadproc is an optimizer that can solve quadratic programming problems, okay? And quadratic programming problems have this form. So we have some quadratic function of our vector x, yeah? So some quadratic form plus a linear term. And we want to minimize this in terms of x. Again, that's actually a simple problem, right? It's a parabola. Um, however, in practice, optimizing something like this can be difficult. Yeah, for example, um, let me draw you something on the board. So um, a 2D parabola, that's basically something that, that looks like this, right? Yeah, so that's a 2D parabola. It's a function that would go into the third dimension now here. And you would just go downhill until you reach a minimum. Yeah, so that is the usual optimization that you're doing. However, sometimes um, this shape of the parabola yeah, might be very badly shaped. And very badly shaped means 
there's one very large eigenvalue and one very small eigenvalue. After the support vector machine topic, we go on with PCA, and then we will discuss um, these kind of shapes and the, how the eigenvalues are describing these shapes as a short preview. Basically, this ellipticity, the radii of the ellipticity, correspond to the eigenvalues, approximately. So if your, um, um, your matrix Q, if that one has very, very small eigenvalues, this can be very narrow into some dimensions. Okay? What does it mean for optimization? It could mean that you're doing some zigzagging and you're needing lots of steps until you reach the optimum. Okay? So in a very long salad dish, yeah, it, you, you jump around until you get there. This doesn't look so catastrophic, but think of x being 1,000 dimensional. And then in very high dimensional, this zigzagging thing can be really tough. By the way, that's the reason why in numerics often people are using a conditioner. Yeah? This has nothing to do with your hair. Yeah? The conditioner makes this matrix nice. And basically, it makes it more circular, so that the whole optimization problem is more circular. And then this zigzagging doesn't happen anymore. Then you're just going downhill, and downhill will reach the center of this. OK? Um, by the way, of course, the center of that one is the origin. But that's why we need this linear offset. OK? So this, this guy over here will shift it to somewhere else. Is it right? No, also that doesn't shift it to somewhere else, right? But um, OK. So in principle, there, there should be a constant to shift it to somewhere else. So we know where the optimum is of this one. OK, so that is the, uh, the minimum of that one. So that is the one in the quadratic programming thing. And if I would have an offset, then it would be somewhere. However, nonetheless, I'm having these zigzagging problems because I'm looking at a more difficult one where I'm also having constraints. And I typically have constraints which are inequalities. So let's say something like, like this. OK. Some matrix A times x is less than or equal to B, where this is a vector and the B is also a vector. And now this is basically saying, I'm not allowed to use any solution only in this half space I'm looking for solutions. OK, so this is like a linear inequality constraint. Then there are sometimes also linear equality constraints. So let's use the same letters, but with subscript EQ. And that corresponds to a straight line on which I have to be. OK, so this quadratic optimization now is optimizing a reasonably simple function, just a parabola, but subject to a linear inequality constraint and a linear equality constraint. So in this case, my solution set is basically only along this line. Yeah, of course, continued indefinitely. Okay? And sometimes even we might have some box constraints. Okay? So there might be a lower bound and some upper bound. Basically now, whatever, drawing a box. <coughs> and then I'm only allowed to be around there. Okay? Um, this is trivial if you draw it in 2D, and it gets very non-trivial if the x is really high dimensional. Okay? So that's why this is a particular nice problem. Um, what about convexity? Yes, linear constraints are, of course, convex functions. Okay? And this parabola thing is also a convex function that we minimize, right? It's a function that looks like this. So it is a special case of convex constraint optimization. And it's one which is like, yeah, it's very interesting already, very useful. However, um, it's, it's more easy to solve than the general, um, for general convex functions. So there are some solvers, typically they are called quad -proc, quad proc, okay? And they tell you in the help that they can solve this problem. Yeah, let me show you an example. Let me fire up MATLAB. I don't know, do you, do you know MATLAB by chance? Yes, you do, OK. MATLAB is a really nice language. Only disadvantage is that it's expensive, OK? And um, so you can use it at university, but then after university, you, when you work for a company and they buy it, everything is fine. If you want to do it as a hobbyist, then you have to pay some money. OK, MATLAB is starting. I think it's super slow. 
So let's continue first and then I show you this quad proc help because it's telling you exactly something like that. However, now we have this optimization problem and when we look at it, we see, yeah, maybe this quadratic thing might be just the right thing, right? Because we have these inner products between the axes and that is like nothing more than a polynomial of degree two, right? Because like the i's point, or maybe the x1 is multiplied with itself, so there can happen something squared, and then there are all these mixed terms as well, okay? Um, ah, no, that, that's not the point, sorry. So here we are optimizing over the alpha, so I need to talk about the alphas, okay? So the alphas take the role of the x, and then basically there could be alpha 1 times alpha 1, which is giving us an alpha 1 squared, so it's an, a parabola in terms of the alpha. But it's a high dimensional one, okay? And that is a linear term. Then that is a linear constraint, and that is yet another linear constraint. Now I just need to translate it into this form. But before we do that, okay, here's my MATLAB. So there is a quad proc, and I just want to show you the help. Okay, the help will be super long, but at the beginning, you will see exactly this problem that we have on the board. Okay? So the quad proc is really solving this constraint optimization. Okay, that doesn't make it more readable. Um, subject to some inequality constraint. However, so that is the easiest call. You can add more parameters to it with A, EQ, and B, EQ when you want to have additional equality constraints as well, okay? And you can have even more parameters, lower bound and upper bound, if you know my variable is like bounded, which is often also called a box constraint, right? Where's the box? The box is there because the x is two-dimensional, for example, and then a lower and an upper bound, the lower bound is a vector and the upper bound is a vector, so you have a box. And so in higher dimensions, you really have a 3D box or a hyperbox, okay? And those constraints, why do they, why to put them here additionally? Because these linear equality, uh, inequality constraints, they are more difficult to handle. So it's these box constraints you can handle more easily in optimization, typically, okay? So you see, when you have this kind of code, quad proc, you can now just translate your support vector machine optimization problem into a quad prop optimization problem. That's what we are going to do now. So here's our dual SVM, and now we just write it in some fancy fashion, okay? Let's start with a simple thing. Okay, we need to turn it into a minimum, yeah? We don't have a maximum in, in the quad proc implementation, but typically we need to minimize something, fine. So we minimize in terms of alpha. Um, that means we just put a minus sign in front of our objective function, yeah? What about the constraints? The constraints just stay the same if I change from minimum to maximum because the constraints, they tell me what are the possible values for alpha. Okay, so, so far so good. The easiest one is this alpha greater or equal to zero where alpha is really a vector. So every component should be positive or zero. So we just turn it around so that it looks more like the one that we had before. And this constraint over here, it can be also written like an inner product between the vector y and the vector alpha. Okay, so far so simple. And we see in terms of alpha, this is a linear equality constraint and that is a box constraint that we can use, okay? So what about this one over here? Let's start with a simple term. The summation of all alpha i, that's another trick can be also written as the inner product of the one vector with my alpha, okay? So that's the same as summing everything up. That's very often um, very useful if you have a formula with a summation sign. You can typically replace it with an inner product with the one vector. And then combined with matrix differential calculus, you can calculate nicely derivatives of it, okay? And then the one gets shuffled around and pops up at some other location in your derivative and Again, you replace the one vector transposed something with the sum yeah, implementation. So only for the mass, you write the one vector, and then in your implementation, you use the summation function that you can typically call of in NumPy for vectors or matrices. Okay, now comes the single complicated term. So that's this quadratic form, and it, it's the translation of the summation. Okay, interesting. So for this, um, I need to tell you what the Q is. So the Q is this weird thing, okay? So let's show on the board that it's the same, yeah? So ideally, I didn't 
don't do a mistake here. So let me first write down the Q. The Q is the diagonal matrix. So it's a capital D. OK, again, my convention. Then it's a matrix. It's a diagonal matrix where I put the vector y along the diagonal. And then I have my data matrix x, x transpose, and again, diag of y. Where, of course, if you prefer, you could put the transpose here for beauty, OK? But since it's a diagonal matrix, it doesn't matter. Yeah? Now, of course, the question is always, what is the x? And the x, um, I hope I'm using this convention here. Uh, let's think about it for a second. Yes, I think I do. It's x1 transpose, x2 transpose, and so on. So even though in some of my lectures, um, the x i's are column vectors in the x, yeah, I think I converge to this shape. So that is a nicer shape. When you talk about PyTorch and about most of the libraries, they typically assume that the first dimension is counting over your data point. And then the second and third and fourth and fifth dimensions, those are the multi dimensions of your data points. Yeah? And that makes nice for loops in Python, for example. Then you can just iterate into the x like this, I think. And you get the 18th element, something like that. Right? And it will, be, have, it will have the shape of the rest of the dimensions. OK. So that is good, because then the product of x with x transposed, OK, those will be all those inner products. OK, let's write this out. So in the top left, what we really have, we have first row times the first column of that one, OK, which is x1 transpose x1, OK? And so forth. Here we have xn transpose x1. and x1 transpose xn. OK, so that is a zoom into z1. The next one that we need to understand is what does it mean to multiply matrix from the, well, let's start with the left-hand side, from the left-hand side with the diagonal matrix. OK, so let's think about it for a second. So this is my diagonal matrix. This is my more general matrix. Let's do the matrix matrix multiplication. I do row times column, OK? So what happens? Only the first entry is non-zero. All the other entries are zero. So I'm just multiplying this top left element with the top left element of the other matrix, OK? And then I'm doing it again. It again takes the first row, but now the second column. So I'm now taking the first row over here. So what I'm basically doing, I'm scaling the first row of the second matrix with the top left element. Similarly, the next one will scale the second row. And the last one will scale the last row. Now you can imagine already what happens if you do it the other way around. Multiplying from the right with the diagonal matrix will scale the columns. Yeah? So it's good to get a feeling how these things work. Why? Because um, of course, I would never implement it like that, right? I mean, that's a complete waste. If I know that it's scaling the rows, then I can do it more cleverly using broadcasting or something in Python, right? I would just say, I don't know whether it works, maybe y, and then the star operator, which is the element-wise product. So here I'm using the... So this is a matrix matrix multiplication. I need to use that one. But then I'm using the normal one. And in many languages like MATLAB, that would be an, um, you get an error message because this is a vector and this is a matrix, so there's a shape mismatch. However, in um, NumPy, for example, I think this will now broadcast to the right shape. And this is like copying the Y as many times as we need. And now by multiplying it from the other side with a transposed version of the Y, okay, it will just do the right thing on the other side. Okay? Good. So far, so good. So this is introduction to scientific computing. However, typically, you only learn it when you need it. So now we need it. So you better learn it. So this thing is scaling the, the row, OK? So that means that now uh, in, my, in my matrix here, let's 
we raise a little bit. From the left hand side, I'm getting a y1 yeah, into the first row and a yn into the last row. So far, so good. And from the right hand side, I'm getting a y1 for the first column. OK. And then a y and for the last column. OK, nice, right? It just matches here the xn, matches the yn, and so this is just, just right. So this is my matrix Q. OK, interesting. Now let's see what's happening if I multiply the Q with my alpha from the left and right. OK? Now this is, again, matrix matrix multiplication. So it's a matrix vector, but I call it matrix matrix with a column vector. Yeah, so basically it means, um, oh, let's write it up here. So alpha transpose Q alpha is equal to alpha transpose all this stuff. And um, basically as well here, so let's write it alpha 1 to alpha n. OK, that's alpha transpose. And here we have alpha 1 to alpha n. OK. So that will be the first row times all of these guys, yeah? And then summing everything up. So it will be the summation over um, the second index over here, let's call it j. And then we have y1, x1, transpose, then we get an xj, right? This is the column index here, the second one, times the yj, n times the alpha j, OK? So let's write it. Um, this is y1, OK, and x1. So we get a big vector here. So that is not a nice sigma sign. Summation over the j, and we have the yn, xn transposed, xj, yj, alpha j. OK, so far so good. And we have still the alpha 1. Is it too much detail for you, or do you like it like this? You like it? OK. I hope you can follow, and you are not copying or anything. N don't need to. Um, it's on the video anyway. OK, next one is again. Now we have two vectors, right? So it's row times column. So this alpha 1 gets multiplied with that one. The alpha n gets multiplied with that one. And everything gets summed up. So what we get is a summation over i over j of alpha i, y i, x i, then x j, y j, and alpha j. And that is exactly what we needed. OK? Another way to think about it, you could also think, what happens if I multiply diagonal matrix with a vector? Yeah? That's just a different way to to view it. So let's just for fun do it. So that is now my matrix, my diagonal matrix, and that is my vector. And um, so the result here will be the first row times this column vector. So all entries are 0, but the first one. So I only take the, alpha, uh, the y1 and multiply it with the alpha 1, OK? So it's y1 times alpha 1 and so on and so forth. So I'm just getting this vector. So we see that, what did we prove here? We proved something that might also be on this cheat sheet from um, the matrix differential calculus. Basically, this is the same as saying y had a ma product with alpha. Yeah? It's the same as putting y into a diagonal matrix and then doing matrix vector multiplication. Okay? Just to see that you can play around with these things. Um, of course, we want to have an expression for Q. Okay? That's why we didn't use this Hadama thing, and that's why we had to use this weird notation with the diagonal matrices, which looks a bit wasteful. But the reason was we wanted to have a single expression for the Q. Okay, and that will be the one that we also are using in our code. Okay, so far so good. So we see that the expression up here with a minus sign is just the 
um, this uh, product alpha transpose Q times alpha, okay? So this is just rewritten now in a nice vectorized fashion, yeah? So far so good? Okay, next step. So here we have this nice rewritten quadratic program. Here we have our quadratic programming API that we get from typing help, okay? So now we need to just match. So it's getting more and more simple. So just by setting the x is the alpha, fine. The c over here, it's the minus one vector. And there you see why it's useful. Otherwise, it's not so easy to translate. But here now, it's really just pattern matching. Then there is no um, inequality constraint that is like non-trivially. Yeah? So they get assigned the zero size matrix. So it's a matrix and a vector. So the A is a matrix of shape 0 times 0. And the B is a vector of shape 0. Yeah? Note that they are not the same, even though I wrote it here, but they are not really the same. Um, then the XL, the lower bound, is just a 0. The X upper bound is infinity. Yeah, that you can also typically write into your optimizer like an inf or something. Yeah, I think it's also in the floating point standard from IEEE. And for the equality constraint, I need the y transpose, and I need the 0 here, OK? So the 0, is it correct? Yes, it's correct. It's really a scalar. Yeah, so this is just a number. OK, so far, so good. Let's look at the code. Um, where is the code? Here's the code. So. Um, I load some, uh, let me run the code once, so then everything should be fine. Um, and then let's start on top. So I'm, I'm loading these libraries, and this is not the right way to do it, right? I'm doing from numpy import star and all these dirty things. I like it a lot because I come from MATLAB. I don't want to write np dot all the time. However, sometimes I get confused by my old code too. So I'm trying to adjust to the new world of writing np dot. And you should too, so it's better to do it. Anyway, I also still like these old functions like rand and rand n and ones and zeros. They are so super useful. So I wrote my own, and I want to have them super flexible, either take a vector or take these arguments. That's this code here. Yeah? You can use it if you like it, or you better go to the usual convention. And now comes a couple of functions that visualize data. So they are just implemented here to have nice plots later on, OK? To do it once, figure out. So those are the ones that eat most of the time, right? Playing around with Plotly library. The plots at the end are really nice, but it's painful to get there. So I have one for showing the iris data set that we will use in a second. And then I have one that kind of, I don't know, somehow I need to fix some access limits for whatever reason. And I want also to show the. Um, separating hyperplanes with a margin. So for that, I need a function add a plane. And that will take the normal vector w, OK, and will plot the proper plane into 3D. Yeah, And this is now something that you probably learn in other lectures how to do it. This is just some linear algebra. I need to calculate some points in the plane, and then I can define a plane with these mesh 3D something, Yeah, whatever. It works. I can also use the functions in three times with some opacity to get some nice margins, plots, and combine all of this. So don't worry about it, about the details, but it's in here if you want to see how to do it. OK, here comes the solver for quadratic programming. Oh, this is the implementation of quadproc. We get to that one in a second. Um, let's first implement now our linear SVM in the dual separable case. OK, so we get some data x and y, where x is now our capital X, OK? I use the small na name here. The y is a vector of the labels. And then at some point, I need some threshold, but that's not really important. So here is where I'm defining my, fun my mat matrix Q, OK? It is really just matrix times blah, blah, blah. And I think it should be equivalent to this code, that it's just y star bracket open and then x at x dot transposed times y transpose, I guess. Yeah, so it should be the same. You can try it. Or I can also try it. No, I'm now, I'm afraid that it doesn't work. So you better try it. So this is a bad implementation. Why? Because here I'm having three matrix matrix multiplication. One, two, three. And matrix matrix is O to the n cube, which is super expensive, right? 
So this is cheaper. This is just one O to the n cube in the middle, and then you have cheaper ones. Okay. Then, okay, we said this constant linear term, yeah, where is it? It's this one, c is equal to minus n. Okay, minus n, we know how to do that. This is just um, minus 1's n, okay? So that is an n-dimensional vector. You see these notations that we introduced on the board to do matrix differential calculus, they all translate into code, okay? So this one matrix, for example, yeah, it's also just code. And having a notation on a piece of paper allow us to do calculations with it. And then we just call the um, quad proc code. Um, we plug in the Q, the C, we have equality constraints here, and we have some lower bounds, which are just these zeros vector. And that's it what we need. We don't need an infinity vector here in this implementation. Okay, and then that's it. So this is calculating and solving the optimization problem. The result is somewhere in result.x, we extract the alpha vector, and now we use this threshold to say what is zero. Yeah, we, it's more robust to say it's zero is a very small number, and so if we are larger than this very small number, those are the support vectors that are then used to calculate w and b. Okay? The w can be calculated just by all of them. However, most of them are zero anyway, so we are just having here a summation of a couple of x. Um, this is now nice because the x has all the data points as rows. So if we multiply from the left a vector, we have a matrix, a row vector, times a matrix in this case, and this will just do the averaging of the x's. Okay, so that is just the formula that we derived. And then only for the support vectors, yeah, so we're calculating y minus x times w. And we marking, we masking it with a Boolean vector. So these support vectors is the Boolean vectors of true and false. So we are just picking those and summing those up and divide by the number of support vectors. So this is a calculation of the B. Yeah, so this times support vector thing, let me show you on the slides, that is selecting all the ones with alpha greater than zero. Okay, and then only averaging those. Yeah. We average all of them, but we first multiply them with the true-false. Okay, so far so good, and that's it. Then we can return W, B, and alpha. Now if we want to check how, uh, what a new data point gets predicted to, we can plug it into just this formula, X times W. And here you need to note, so um, where are we? Here we are multiplying something from the left to the X. So this is summing over the data points. Here I'm, I'm multiplying something from the right to the x, and this is summing over the different dimensions of x. So my weight vector is having entries for each dimension of x. So this matrix vector multiplication has dimensionality d, if my data is d-dimensional, and this matrix uh, vector matrix multiplication has dimensionality n, okay, since there are n data points. Okay, and I'm just checking whether my, my prediction is greater or equal to zero, and this gives me a, okay, I want to have it as an integer, so it will be ones and zeros will be the labels, okay? Similarly, I can calculate the accuracy. I could use the function predict for that, but here I'm using just the function accuracy that's kind of simpler, because then I just can calculate the mean of these outcomes here, okay? So that's the simpler way. However, the more that I think about it, that's slightly wrong, isn't it? I mean, so there might be some values like 0 0.1 or 0. Point, oh, no, there are not, since this is a Boolean expression. Okay, so this is, again, a Boolean expression, so the result will be 1 or 0 if I average over them. So everything is fine. Great. So that is the implementation of the linear SVM. Let's see it in action. Okay, here's a simple balanced toy data set. Yeah, balance means... I have as many examples of the positive class as I have of the negative class. So how do I do this? I generate a random Gaussian blob and along one vector, and then I shift half of the data, yeah? So the first half gets shifted by five in all dimensions, yeah? So it's three-dimensional, and I'm moving it in x1, x2, and x3. I'm moving it by five, yeah? And same for the labels. I'm setting them to minus one. Okay, so this 
is nice, because now I have two very simple classes that I understand very well, and the five needs to be chosen such that they are separable, OK? Since we are looking at the separable case. Great. Then we just call our nice function with x and y, and we get our weight vector and our offset, and the vector alpha as well. So now all the optimization is hidden somewhere in some optimizer. So you only have to do this hard thinking how to implement it once, OK? Um, great. We can uh, print the accuracy, we can print the alphas and show it all this, and then we have a look at a 3D scatter plot. Accuracy is 1, which means it's perfect. We see that the alphas are almost all 0, but for some support vectors, we get some weight vector w and some b. And we can also view it, and then you get this nice looking 3D graphic, OK? So where you see here that this is a separating hyperplane. It was calculated by, calculated by using w and b, OK? And those are the margins. Those are the same hyperplanes, but a bit shifted by some offset, basically by 1, scaled appropriately with the length of w, OK? And you see nicely that it will touch. This point is touched, and here are also two points are touched. Those are the support vectors, the ones that are exactly on the boundary. OK? And you can also see, so with that many points, any other solution would have touched fewer points, maybe, or maybe not only fewer. It could, have, could also touch this point up here, but then the margin would have been much smaller, right? So if this point would have been on the margin, in principle that would be possible, then we would have had a smaller separating plane. OK, why was that such a big deal in the year 2000, right? I mean, there were already nice books from Jan Lecoeur from 1998, Tricks of the Trade, a nice Springer book with lots of tricks. So there were neural networks around. Why now did support vector machines make such a big splash? Why was it such a great thing? Because Neural networks were, at that point, considered to be like a black art, OK? Computation was not as fast as now. So now you can have a little demo. It just runs during the lecture, yeah? But at that time, it was very slow. And then to do model selection or to tweak the hyperparameters so that it really works, it was requiring some, um, yeah, some knowledge or some skills. So it was not so easy to get them to run. In particular, the optimization of neural networks is super nonlinear. OK, the optimizer says nonlinear is not the, the problem. The question is whether it's convex or non-convex. OK, it's very non-convex. So the optimization of a neural network is super non-convex in the parameters. So all optimizers say, yeah, we can do it, sure, but I don't expect we reach a global optimum or something. We reach some local minimum only with neural networks. And so we never know. Yeah, you never know. So it was kind of unpopular. However, already at that time, or maybe it was later, I was at a conference and Jan Lecoeur was giving a talk, and then he was showing again, so he was more like talking about neural networks, that was his big topic, and he was showing, no, it's not a black art, everybody can do it, and then he showed the result of some hobbyist, I think a lawyer or something, who in his spare time programmed a neural network and got it to work. And of course, it's kind of surprising that it looks like, okay, then maybe it's not so difficult really. Nonetheless, support vector machines were nice, because you have a nice mathematical optimization problem where you are guaranteed to find the global solution. Yeah? So it's working very well. So there are no local optima in this formulation. And there are some very nice theoretical underfitting about risk and empirical risk and the maximum margin idea and all of this as well. So there was a nice mathematical theory behind it, and it always gives a good result. And when you look into the, I think it was a PhD thesis of Bernhard Schulkopf, he looked at, uh, he, he did many experiments with support vector machines, and he showed that he can get state-of-the-art results on big benchmarks for classification, right? So there are these um, UCI data sets, and I think support vector machine at that point was getting the best results. Of course, afterwards, neural network came again, and they tried again with more tricks or more optimization, and they even got possibly even better results. But at that point, support vector machines were on the one end state-of-the-art, and they have very nice properties of finding a global optimal solution, which is still a very nice thing, right? However, in a way, the reason why neural networks then were sold as deep learning is this is very shallow learning, as we will see in the next lecture when we talk about kernel functions. So we are having 
a very shallow neural network basically with only one hidden layer in a way. Okay, so it's not super expressive or the expressiveness has to go into the kernel function which is typically fixed. So this is shallow learning but mathematically very nice and it gave very great performance at that point of time. Yeah? And so for a long time, like say 2000 until 2010, if you want to publish a paper at NeurIPS, formerly known as the NIPS conference, um, you needed to have something like SVM in your title or kernel machine. Those are kernel machines at the end. And if you say something about neural networks, that's really hard to sell, right? People were not so much interested in neural network at that point. That change, and maybe it changes again in support vector machines, maybe with an added twist that you will add, yeah, are again great and are better than all these, these GPU trained neural networks, but maybe not, right? So I'm not sure about it. Okay, so that is it. What is missing? So we are still missing um, the implementation of quadproc, which I also want to show you because it's, I want to show you how to do it, right? Because it's not there in my NumPy implementation. So let me show you that one. But, oh, a second, before I show you, here's another example with unbalanced data, yeah? Unbalanced data means 95 positive, five negative elements. And surprisingly, for support vector machines, it doesn't matter, yeah? It also just works. Why? Because your solution is sparse. So only a couple of vectors are really relevant to define where the plane is. If I have even more red points over here, it won't influence the optimal solution in this case, okay? And that's why support vector machine can deal very well with unbalanced data. Okay, that is just an aside. Let's get back to the slides. Um, we are now, re we have reduced our support vector machine problem to a quadratic pro programming problem. Yeah, that's uh, for me not easy to say. And now you find out, oh, MATLAB is so expensive, I want to run it in Python. So can I have my own quad proc implementation? And of course you can have, and I show you how to do it. And it's basically just another example of these steps that we went through. So we reformulated an optimization pro problem to fit the quadratic programming setup. And now we reformulate it to uh, the quadratic programming problem to fit some other optimization method, which is more general, okay? And those are, for example, the interior point nonlinear optimization methods. They look at this problem. So you have some objective function f, you have some constraints, function g, okay? And some lower and upper bounds, and you have some box constraints. And curiously, you can translate this problem into z1, okay? How are we doing this? We just need to implement f and g. Okay, that's it. And let's see. Uh, yeah, that's how we do it. Question might be, so what about the equality constraint? How can I get them in here as well? There the trick is, just say gl is equal to gu. Okay, that's it. By the way, I'm not an expert in how this then really is implemented. That's then something for the numerics people, yeah? Or you have to do it yourself as well. Yeah, that's also possible. I think approximately you are minimizing this function with gradient descent. However, you get penalized by violating that one. That doesn't mean it, it's impossible to violate your constraints, but for example, you could say, okay, minimize the f of x, go downhill, but if you are outside of this region of the axis, you pay a lot, okay? And of this combined function, you can do a gradient descent and then you can, you can make it at some point that it's required to fulfill this, okay? So it's not fine to pay something here. So basically the weight that this expression gets goes to infinity at some point. But at the beginning it's very relaxed and you're fine, okay, try to minimize f. Yeah, it's not great yet, it's not feasible yet, so we're not fulfilling all constraints, but we're getting there because we're penalizing it. And then you increase the penalization of that one, and at some point you will have an, a good solution. Okay, that approximately what these things are doing. Okay, what do we have to implement to use this function? For that one, um, we need to look at some SciPy function. Let's see where we have it. Um, it must be over here. Okay, so here's my quadproc implementation. So again, we have to find a lot of assignments to some special functions here, uh, some special matrices 
Ah, no, they are given, sorry. So they are given, yeah, so those are the inputs, and we want to translate it into something that is calling the function minimize. Okay, where is minimize coming from? Minimize is coming from scipy.optimize. Okay, let's look at the help for the minimize thing, okay? Oops, how can I look? No, I want to get out of this, this help. I want to show you the help for the minimize function. There it is. Help minimize. Oops. Okay, that is the help function. What do we need to plug in? We need to plug in a function. Yeah, this is functional programming. The input is a function. A starting point, some additional arguments, blah, 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 blah. Then there are some bounds. The bounds are probably box constraints. And then there are co some constraints. The constraints are also functions. And then there's also a Hessian. Yeah? We have to give it a Hessian, if we have it. If we don't have the Hessian, then we don't have it. Okay? Then the algorithm has to do something more clever. If we have it, great. Minimize will profit from it and choose a nice method. So the, F, uh, the fun up here must be really a, a function that can be called. Um, Depending, okay, now behind minimize are a couple of methods. Nelda, Mead, Powell, whatever, conjugate gradient, this is this BFGS method, and so on and so forth. And depending on the parameters that you give it, it will choose a different one, okay? So this is not very convenient to use if you just want to solve a quadratic programming problem, right? Because it's easier just to give some other function matrices and blah, 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 called quadproc, and the quadproc should figure out how to solve this one using this function, okay? In particularly, we need to implement the constraint function and the gradients of all of these, okay? So let's do that. Um, so this will be the implementation, but I show you first on the board here, or on the, on the slides. So we have to implement the function f, the function g, and we need gradients of these functions. It doesn't need it always. It could use finite differencing, but if you have implementation of these gradients, then minimize will be f much faster and ideally also an implementation of the Hessian of the Lagrangian. Okay, let's look at this. So this is our f function. That is easy to implement, right? So we can write just code for it. The gradient of it is just a linear function. Yeah, this is really, I mean, now that you know how to take derivatives, so this will be just if you put a d in front, you will get twice x transpose q times dx, but you have a half, so it will be really the derivative will be qx of the first term, and of a linear term it will be just a c. Okay, so this is just the derivative or the gradient of this vector input function, okay? A scalar valued function of a vector. Then we have the g of x, and the g of x, um, we have some inequality constraints, we implement them with just a times x, and we have equality constraints, we put it into the same module here, so the gx is calculating a long vector, yeah? and the gradient of this is very simple, it's just a and a eq, okay? So we can just read it off. Then the bounds, okay, for the equality constraints, we just set it to b eq, the upper bound and the lower bound, okay? And by this, implementing an equality constraint. And for the other one, we need minus infinity and then our b. Okay, that is also given in the optimization. Now this is infinitely sub m. Yeah, this is just telling us that is a vector of size m. Yeah, where every entry is minus inf. Yeah. Okay, so far so good. The Hessian of the Lagrangian can be also calculated as just the matrix Q. So why is that the case? Because the Hessian of a linear function is zero. Okay, and the Hessian of a squared function is this matrix in between and the constraints are all linear. So my Lagrangian will have these additional terms in terms of x, but they are all linear. So really the Hessian of the Lagrangian is just the Hessian of my objective function up here. So far, so good. Um, we can now plug everything together. So this is the quadproc help that we also seen in MATLAB. So what are we trying to solve with quadproc? This code that follows now is just nice because so you can omit any of those, yeah? However, if there is none given, yeah? In that case, I need to ensure that it gets some proper values. And those are the proper values. 
In particular, sometimes you need a zeros, zero matrix uh, vector in this case. So that is a vector of length zero. Or here we have a matrix uh, of length zero, but it must have the right shape. Otherwise, the rest won't work. Okay. I could have put all of these into the first line. I could have said a is equal to zero, zero comma c shape, and so on and so forth. Maybe I do that. I, I could put here a return, right, and then I can pl plug them in. Then I could get rid of this code. Yeah, maybe I should. Okay. Now I need to implement my function, my objective, which is okay. I use lambda. I like lambda a lot. Lambda x. And then comes the quadratic form times the linear term. Then comes the bounds. Now this is a special function that is provided by scipy dot optimize. Okay, and it's a function to define bounds for the minimize function. So it's a certain object. Similarly, here the constraints that get passed onto minimize they are also generated with some object constructor that is provided by the by um, uh, scipy dot optimizer okay and what does it take okay if it's a linear constraint fine i just give it matrices and it will do the rest automatically so this thing calculates automatically the derivatives and all of these things because for linear constraints it's easy there are other functions that generate nonlinear constraints and for those of course you need to provide implementations of g and implementations of the gradients um, now the question is, where is the Hessian? Okay, I don't give it the Hessian. Okay, I could give it the Hessian. I have it, but I, f I forgot how to do it. Maybe it was something like this, right? But I'm now not. I don't take any risks now. So this is something to try at home, okay? Because sometimes it takes hours to get it to work. Yeah, and I don't know whether you know this. Yeah, as a computer scientist, you always think it's very easy, right? You just do it, and then you do it, and an hour and another hour and another hour passed, yeah, and that's just how it is for every one of us. So if it's for you like that, that's normal. Okay, so this is the implementation of the quadprog function. Okay, and it is very general. You can plug in whatever you like. What is the difficulty here? The difficulty is to get these things right, yeah, so that you have a nice implementation where you can also omit the arguments. Yeah, so that's the difficulty. So far, so good. Okay, so that is the way to do it. So here's a summary. So first of all, we formulate our optimization problem as a quadprog, and then you call quadprog. If you don't have it, you have to implement it yourself and use some general optimizer to do, as I just showed. If you don't have a general optimizer, you have to dig deeper and have to implement it yourself. And it's not impossible, right? If you went so far in this lecture, I'm sure you are able to implement interior point methods. Yeah. That, that should be possible. Just look it up, what it is, and then translate it. Yeah, just think about math books as being yet another programming language where you can look up code, okay? And then it's easy. So far, so good. Um, any questions about the implementation details that I gave you? None? Okay, that's fine. Either no one is understanding anything, so that's some possibility, but looking at your faces, I think some of you got something out of it. Okay, what have we done so far? We looked at the linearly separable case, and that was already quite interesting, right? We learned a lot about implementation, about optimization. Let's go one step further to the linearly non-separable case, okay? Just to remind you what this is, um, a little picture. So, uh, okay, let's take plus and minus. So that is a linearly separable case because I can draw a straight line between them. However, typically data is noisy and there might be some minus signs and some plus signs on the other side as well. Nonetheless, this is a good decision boundary, right? Because like the majority of the minus ones are over there and the majority of the pluses are down here. So somehow it still makes sense to do this. However, what is now a margin? So that is kind of unclear now, right? Because there are some really, some really wrong examples here. So again, we want to find a max margin solution here, but we will note there is a trade-off kind of, right? Between how fine are we with some wrong examples or not. So the size of the margin here is not as descriptive anymore as it was before. So before the size of the margin yeah, was really, um, 
I guess. No, not, not always, but in some cases, Yeah, it's like this, this, the, the width of the largest river that you can let go through it, okay? However, here the meaning is not clear anymore because there are some examples which are on the wrong side. And so we will see that we will have a new hyperparameter. Yeah, let me tell you which it is. It's called C, C like constant. It's a hyperparameter um, that will choose how large the margin will be between the two classes. For the linear case, that's not so relevant yet. The solution won't change much. However, in the nonlinear case, the solution will change drastically by changing the C. Okay? How do you choose the C? Cross validation. Okay? It's a hyperparameter. Okay, so that is the non separable case. Now, by the way, um, that's another additional um, link here. Uh, I'm doing a lot of searching when I prepare my lectures, and I couldn't find in many, uh, I couldn't find really a good description of the derivation of this offset B, right? So it's often put under the carpet. However, I want to mention this publication from Zaki Myra. Yeah, I think this is also a book which you can access online from Cambridge University Press. So there's some quality control. So this is really a good book. And they really nicely work out the derivation of this B, okay? And then projecting that onto slides is what you've seen in the lecture. So I got it from them, I think, with some thinking. Good, now comes the linearly unseparable case. So here's the separable case, so far so good. This was non-trivial to derive, fine. In the non-separable case, unfortunately, some of our constraints are always violated. Okay, so there won't be a straight line that puts everyone on one side and the other guys on the other side. So there won't be a so-called feasible solution. By the way, feasible means fulfilling all constraints. That's like also a technical term from mathematics. A feasible solution fulfills all constraints. Oh, that's what I wrote behind. Oh, great, yeah, so it's also here. Um, how can we now relax this optimization problem? Relaxing is done if you do slack, okay? So slack, I don't know what the right translation is for slack, um, but the people in mathematics call these variables slack variables that we add here now, and basically it says, Okay, we all want to be larger, greater or equal to one, but some of you won't make it, okay? And you, you get some extra bonus here. You can be a little bit smaller, okay? So that's fine. So you can have some slack, yeah? So relax, it's fine. Be a little bit, of, be a little bit wrong. However, overall, we have to pay for it, okay? And we pay for it the summation of all psi i, okay? Paying means instead of now optimizing only minimizing the, maximizing the margin, so minimizing the norm of W, we also want to minimize the slack. So ideally the slack is zero, yeah? So that would be the best. Then we have a separating hyperplane, but if we can't get it to zero, we want to find that solution that has the smallest possible slack, okay? However, now, what do we weigh more? Do we want to have a large margin? Is that what we want? Or do we want to weigh having like a very, very small slack to pay? And that is basically what the hyperparameter C is making a trade-off, okay? So it's trading off the max margin and minimizing the slack. So here's the formulation. So instead of having just the summation of the norm of W, we now have the additional term C times the costs, the additional costs of having some slack, okay? And we are minimizing this, so we want to make it as small as possible. Okay, just let psi i go to minus infinity, right? So then you make it really small. So for that reason, we need these additional constraints here. So they must be positive, so uh, or greater or equal to zero, okay? So you can, uh, you, you can be very, very small, and very, very small means you are zero, but that's it, you can't be smaller, okay? So there's a stop to that one. Um, and then our constraints are now relaxed. Basically, it means, let's say one of these is minus 0.5, so really bad. Then we can pay with a psi of 1.5, and everything is okay, okay? And now you see there's this, now the trade-off is uh, one, first to make it feasible, so to get a solution at all, but then depending on the C, we might get slightly different solutions, okay? 
um, as I said, we get a new hyperparameter. We didn't have a hyperparameter so far, right? We only might change the dimensionality of our axis with basis functions or something, so that could be viewed like a hyperparameter, like a hypothesis world or something. But now we have a new hyperparameter which has to be tuned, for example, using cross-validation. Okay, so here's our primary problem for the soft margin, and um, we can plug it into our optimizer, sure, but we will derive the dual problem, of course, to have another option. And again, yeah, you can implement this and it will work. However, we want to get to the nonlinear, non-separable case. And let me tell you, for the linear, non-separable case, the primal problem cannot be implemented. So we need the dual problem, okay? So let's, again, do the dual problem for that one, okay? And I try to do it on the board. I think then it's most fun for you, or at least, I'm stopped and I cannot just gloss over something that is super complicated because I have to tell you or I have to write it. Okay, so let's see. First challenge is to copy it right onto the board. Okay, I tried to memorize this, but I might need to flip back and forth. Okay, so my Lagrangian. So what are the variables? Can anyone tell me that I have? X, Y. Any, so what are the variables of my primal problem? I show you again the slide. Here's my minimization problem. So please remember the primal variables. So what are the primal variables? You can just say it. Say something wrong. W, great. Another one? There's one missing. Yeah, this, this is other Greek letter, yeah, which is a xi. Okay? So this approximately is a, is a xi. I'm also not very good at writing. Okay, so those are the primal variables. Okay, great, let's write it out here because, um, okay, and then come some other variables. So last time we had an alpha, and the alpha was for all of those constraints here, right? So we had an alpha, but now we have these constraints as well. So we need even more dual variables, okay? So we need a beta as well. So those are the dual variables. Okay, next, uh, let's write it down. And I like to use the inner product notation. I prefer it. I think it's nicer, okay? Plus C times summation of the psi i. Um, yeah, great. We can do it like this. Or we can also use this notation here. Let's use that one, okay? This is more like programming style. Okay, this is the objective. Yeah, so this is one vector times xi vector. Now comes the constraints. So that's the most difficult thing to write out. I think I use a minus sign here. And then I have alpha i times yi. And then comes uh, w transpose xi plus b. Um, and now comes the hard part. So w transpose blah, and that should be minus 1 plus psi i. OK, approximately. I think this is right. Um, how can we check it? OK, let me write down the constraint. So the constraint was y i w transpose x i plus b. So this should be greater or equal to 1 minus psi i, OK? Um, now, we typically want to have something like a constraint, blah, blah, smaller like this, right? So that's the usual way to write it. I now use the other way around and put a minus sign, OK? That's fine. Um, so I just move these ones to the other side, and I get a minus 1 and a plus psi. So this turns into a minus sign and this into a plus greater or equal to 0. 
Okay? And now if I want to have it the other way around, I would put a plus and a minus, and here a plus. Okay? So this is okay and correct. Then there was another constraint, and that was the psi i is greater or equal to zero for all i. Okay? So this is again a greater or equal, so let's put a minus sign. Okay? And then it's just beta transpose psi i. Also psi, not psi i. Again, this is an inner product. So this is really just summation of beta i times psi i summation. Okay? Let me check whether I have already a mistake. No, this is a Lagrangian. Okay, great. Fine. Now, what's the strategy of getting a dual problem? Is getting rid of w, b, and psi. Get rid of the primary variables and get an optimization problem in the other one. Okay? So, let's calculate the derivative with respect to w and b. Um, for this, let's rewrite it a little bit so this can all stay the same. But now, let's move that part out of the bracket. Yeah, so this is alpha times this times that one. So let me rewrite it. That can be rewritten as um, W transpose times the summation of I, alpha I, Y I, X I. OK. Uh, where I, rem I omitted the B. Or maybe I should, I should write it out for you. OK, so let's rewrite it. And I rewrite it, and then I show you, try to convince you that this is indeed right. So W transpose summation over i, alpha i, y i, x i. So that is taking care of this term. However, there's also a term with the b. So minus summation of alpha i, y i times b. OK? I first write everything up, and then we discuss whether I forgot something. Then I have minus times minus, and it gets the um, alpha is in front of it, so it's a summation of alpha i. And then I have a summation of alpha i times the psi, so this will be minus minus, so it's 1 minus psi i. OK, great. So far, so good. And then I have a term over here, which I have already in a nice form. OK, do I have all terms? Maybe the most funny one is that one. How did I do it? I somehow dragged out the w, which does not depend on my i. Yeah, I first got rid of the back terms here. And then when you look at this expression, yeah, I can drag out the w. Oh, I can drag in the alpha i and the y i. I can drag into the inner product. And then I can also drag the summation into the inner product. And then we see it's just w transpose times that. By the way, as it turned out, later on, we figured out that this thing is equal to w. And then we had 1 half w transpose minus blah, and we got a minus 1 half in the other story last time. Okay? We will get today the same result. OK, now what about that one? That is the minus sign summation alpha i y i times b, where the b doesn't depend on i either, so I can drag the summation out. And then I have minus minus, so this is giving me a man minus psi times alpha i, okay, into minus beta transpose blah. Okay, great. So this is making things slightly simpler because now I'm not using matrix differential calculus, I'm just writing out the solution. OK, so the gradient with respect to w, yeah, I need to calculate the derivative of that one, which is, I think, just 2 times w, and 1 goes away. So it's just w. Minus w times some constant, so it's just the constant. OK, that's my first one. Um, that is nice because setting this one to 0 just gives me again w is equal to i alpha i y i x i as before. OK, nothing changed. Next one, derivative of, or oh, we can also do it over here. 
So derivative with respect to b. So the reason why I write it like this is to make the derivatives really simple, right? The only location is this b over here. So the derivative with respect to b is just this constant in front of it. Okay, so it's minus summation of alpha i y i, which I can also just write as alpha transpose y. Okay, it's the same thing. This is the same as that expression. Okay, and setting this to zero is giving me another constraint. Okay, that needs to be fulfilled. Great. Now comes something new. Now comes the derivative with respect to xi. Okay, so with respect to xi, so the xi exists over here and it exists over there. Oh, I omitted that one, right? I forgot it. So let's put it in. So where does it go in here? Um, minus minus. So it's a, it's a c times xi thingy over here. Ah, so this is not written well up. So let me copy it over here. C times the one vector, or maybe that wasn't a good idea. Let's use that one. Okay, so like this. Okay, uh, we can sort these terms in the back a little bit to make them nicer. Yeah, let's make them nicer. Um, Let's sort them by these psi i, okay? So let's say uh, this is summation of the alpha i, right? Summation of alpha i is this expression minus summation of alpha i psi i, okay? That is alpha i times psi i. Then we have beta i times psi i. And then we have c times psi i, okay? But with a plus sign, c times psi i. Okay, so with other words, summation of the alpha i minus, and now I can sort it, summation of c minus alpha i minus beta i times psi i, okay? This is much nicer since we want to take the derivative with respect to xi. Okay, so let's use that part over there to calculate the derivative with respect to xi. And it will be just c minus alpha minus beta. That's it. Yeah, let's take psi 1. For psi 1, the derivative is c minus alpha 1 minus beta 1. Psi 2, it's c minus alpha 2 minus beta 2. So we get a long vector, which is just c times alpha times this one. And if we want to be like very code style, then we would say this is an, a vector, c times a vector, a scalar times a vector. However, I think we are fine. I think we can understand this. OK, so let's also set this one to 0. Um, from that equation, we can derive an expression for beta, okay? So we can eliminate beta as well. So that's good. So we get um, beta as c minus alpha, okay? Now what do we get here? So now let's plug everything in. So we have a new Lagrangian here. Oh, it's only a Lagrangian now of alpha. Actually, it's only a Lagrangian of alpha at the end. So let's do that. So this is still on the video, good. Okay, first of all, let's plug in the w is equal to this expression, okay? So that is basically here, a w transpose w minus a w transpose w. So it's a minus one half, okay? Minus one half, and then we have again this double summation, alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j, x i transpose x j. Okay, and this cannot be read. Alpha i, alpha j. Okay, this one is the combination of that term and that term. And there's no more w's in here. Then we have the alpha y, which is this term is equal to zero, so this term just disappears, eliminating the b. 
Um, then we have that one. We shouldn't forget it. So that is plus summation of the alpha i. So far, it looks very much like the objective that we had before. Yeah, it is the same objective. Um, next, um, we can plug in c minus alpha for the beta. Okay, if we plug in, let's use that, that expression over here. So we have um, this one is basically c minus alpha minus beta transpose times xi. And if I plug in here c minus alpha minus c plus alpha transpose xi, then this will be equal to 0. OK, that term also disappears. OK, nice. Now what do we get? We get this objective here. However, there are some constraints on the alpha yeah, subject to the alphas must be greater or equal to 0. OK, and there's another constraint where I'm kind of wondering where I get it from. Um, oh, the other thing was the beta must be also greater or equal to 0. OK, why is that? Because the beta was the Lagrange multiplier for the inequalities of the xi. And so the inequalities of the xi require that their KKT multiplier, Lagrange multiplier, is greater or equal to 0. So here I have another equation that I haven't used. It implies that the alpha is less than or equal than the c. So subject to this constraint. And again, we still have this constraint as well, which is alpha transpose y should be equal to 0. So far, so good. Anything unclear? So the unclear thing to me is, when is it good to use the vector notation, and when is it good to use the summation notation? Yeah? So that's kind of unclear to me. Um, something that can be learned from this is, sometimes it's a good idea, if you do these kind of calculations, not to take the derivative up here with respect to xi or something, but first sort the terms so that you get something really nice, and then you can just read it off. OK? OK, so far so good. So here's the whole calculation for your pleasure, OK? So this is Lagrangian written out. Here I'm doing these steps, and I'm isolating it in a nice way. And then I'm calculating the derivatives. OK, so far so good. We've seen it on the board. Um, I plug all of those into the Lagrangian and end up with the expression that we just seen here on the board. And then comes the trick. We can eliminate the betas yeah, by combining this alpha being greater or equal to 0 and beta being greater than 0 with the equality that c is equal to alpha minus beta. Okay? And this is getting rid of the betas. However, we get a new constraint that the, c's are, that the alphas are limited by c. OK, so here's the dual problem for the non-separable case. So instead of minimizing in w, b, and xi, we can minimize just in alpha. Yeah? which is as difficult as before. So here are both problems. Uh, so here just is the, OK, here, this looks very much like the other one. And we will compare it with the separable case in a second. But before that, um, this is a brief summary on the so-called soft margin. So hard margin means separable case. Soft margin means the non-separable case. OK, that's just the wording. Yeah? So there could be possible outliers that violate our separating hyperplane. The starting point was the slack variables that we introduced here. And then we derived a dual problem. And surprisingly, it looks very much like the old one. The question is, can you spot the difference? So what is different from the other dual problems that we had before? Any ideas? Of course, you don't know it by heart anymore. But any, anyone sees a difference? to the other one that we had before? Yes? Now we have a C. So then here's a C in here, right? So it must appear somewhere down here. And it appears down here. So the only thing that changes is now the C greater or equal than alpha. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? I find it amazing. 
this is much more sophisticated with these slack variables. However, the dual problem is just a very tiny change. Okay, why is it nice? That means your implementation is really, really simple of that one. Okay, you just need to add one little constraint, and you have the non-separable case. Um, let me show you the implementation first because um, it's so easy and nice now. So let me jump to the non-separable case. So this is the non-separable case. And this is the implementation of the linear SVM dual. And I omitted the word separable now because this is capturing both cases, of course, right? Um, it takes, again, data and labels. And now, additionally, this strange hyperparameter C. And the rest of the implementation is identical. The only difference here now is that the upper bound is now defined to be c times once. That's it. The rest stays the same. OK, almost. So the calculation of the w stays the same. Yeah, that's so far so good. The calculation of the b looks almost the same. However, it's a bit more subtle which vectors to use. And we will discuss that now. OK? So far, it, we use the vectors where the alpha is greater than 0. However, now we have some alphas which hit the C, and we just have to distinguish these cases a little bit to really figure it out, what to calculate here. So that's what's coming next. So how can we calculate W and B given the alpha in the non-separable case? Now we have, from the complementary slackness condition, uh, that was a KKT condition already for the other optimization problem we had. We now have a slightly different version with the Xi here, OK? And so this formula is only useful for calculating the B if my alpha is positive, right? Because if the alpha is positive, then the back part must be 0. So then I can use it kind of to make a derivation. However, the Xi i should be also 0. Otherwise, I cannot use this equation because I don't have the Xi's yeah, in the alphas. Um, and there's another complementary slackness condition, which is basically these beta i times xi i must be equal to 0 as well. However, there we can also plug in the, our, our constraints that we got from the calculated derivative with respect to xi i. Okay? So now let's see how we can turn this expression. Yeah, basically, we want to have this blue expression, turn it into equation equal to 0 to derive a formula for b. And the question is, which alphas are we allowed to use? OK, I tell you which alphas we are allowed to use first. So the ones that are not C and that are not 0, OK? So they are not allowed to be C. That's important. So why is that the case? So let's first do the case where the alpha i's are really between 0 and C, OK? In that case, um, we have this complementary selectors condition, the constraints at the xi i's were greater or equal to 0, yeah? That tells us that either c minus alpha is 0 or the xi i are 0. But if the alpha is really smaller than the c, we know that c minus alpha is non zero. So the xi i must be 0. Okay? So now we have an i, an index i, where we know the xi i is 0. That's great, because then this expression is already nice and simple, and there's no disturbing xi in there. Now, for the um, to ensure that the alpha is also non-zero, yeah, we basically also assume that the alpha is greater than uh, zero. So that's the situation. So if we have that, then we know that um, this functional margin is really equal to one for those i where we have where we are between zero and c. Okay, and basically it also means, by the way, it's not clear from the equations, but it means that the x i lie exactly on the margin. Okay. And now, by picking all vectors, uh, by picking all alphas with this property, yeah, we can calculate now a couple of b's, and they should be all the same, but we average them for numerical reasons. Okay? Those xi are commonly called now support vectors. Um, for the alpha being equal to 0, in this case, they will lie outside the margin. So if alpha is equal to 0, Basically, the xi i must be also 0. Yeah? And that's a sub subtle case distinction here, which makes it a bit complicated and messy. Yeah? So the xi i being equal to 0 doesn't, uh, does help us to get this inequality, but it doesn't give us an equality that we can use to derive a formula for b. So that's not useful for us. 
Now comes the strange thing. So if the alphas are equal to C, they are also called support vectors. So I looked this up. That's the case. If the alpha is non-zero, yeah, they are called support vectors. However, they are only useful for calculating the B if the alpha didn't hit the C. And now this is like little technicalities, which are only important if you want to implement it yourself. Why am I going through this with so much detail? Yeah, maybe you have another problem, maybe a ranking problem, maybe another mathematical problem, maybe some machine learning problem, and you can derive a mathematical optimization problem from it. Okay? Then you can use all these tricks to get a really nice algorithm, okay, which is super powerful. Okay, the W gets calculated as before, and relevant are only the ones where the alpha is greater than zero. That's why the alpha greater than zero are called support vectors, because they support my W. They support the plane. They define where the plane is. Okay? However, to calculate the B, yeah, I need to transform this complementary slackness condition, and I get only uh, something useful if my alpha is between zero and C but not if my alpha is zero or not if my alpha is exactly equal to c. And in that case, I get the usual formula as before. And the rest is as before. Okay, so the other difficulty in the implementation is now the part below. Take the alpha and calculate the b. And that's basically the question is, how do you choose now the support vectors? And these support vectors in this code are the ones, that's why I'm writing it here, the support vectors are only where my c is greater alpha greater zero. But those are not the support vectors for calculating the w. OK, so far so good. So that is the implementation. Uh, what's coming here? Oh, is this just, again, a box with an algorithm that you can copy and implement? So you start with data, find an alpha that solves this optimization problem, and then use alpha to get the parameters of the decision function, yeah, where the w is just this linear combination and the b is calculated using the KKT conditions, as on the previous slide. So which one should we solve, the primal or the dual? Until now, yeah, the primal problem is fine. Yeah? Um, however, for the non-separable case, the dual problem already becomes quite attractive. Why? Because here we already have now d plus n plus 1 variables. So the plus 1 is the b, the d is the w, and the n are now our xi's. So in the primal problem, we have as many variables as there are, as there are data points, which could be a lot, plus d. Yeah? And we have lots of constraints, which are somewhat, so some are just box constraints, and box constraints, and n more complicated constraints. So you could use it if d is less than n, OK? However, I think a nicer way to do it is to use a dual problem, then we only have n variables, which are even fewer on the other side. Yeah? However, it comes at the cost of calculating an n squared matrix here. And that's why I'm saying use it if d is less than n. In that case, the primal problem is better okay, and faster. However, this n by n matrix when we talk about nonlinear SVM, it will get a special role. It will be called the kernel matrix in turning everything nonlinear. So in the nonlinear case, we have to solve the dual problem. OK? So far, so good. So that was the non-separable case with the primal and the dual. How do we get a nonlinear SVM? I show you next time. And today, I just show you a couple of examples now for the non-separable case using our new code that we have here, OK? So let's take the iris data, OK? The iris data has three classes, great. Um, two cla th the blue class is separated from all the rest, and these classes are not separated from the rest. So we can use the green and the red ones for our example here. Um, before we do that, I think we, we first, yeah, we now merge the the two classes on the right, OK, and want to train a support vector machine for red against blue. Again, notice having unbalanced data set is not an issue for a support vector machine here, so that's fine. For some other method, it is. Now we are also doing, we split it into training and testing set here, OK, and then we run the linear SVN for the, oh, first for the separable case, OK, why for the separable case? Is it a typo? No, it's for the non separable. It's for the non-separable case, so the typo is the typo here. Um, and what do we get? Let's see. 
Why is it so weirdly looking? Okay. Oh, I need to practice crawling. The difficulty on a Mac is there are some things with one finger, with two fingers, or with three fingers. And this is too, too hard if you get older. Okay, now here, we see that it kind of nicely made a reasonable decision, right? So it's kind of reasonable to be like a little bit diagonal over here, and it's nicely splitting red and blue, even though there are some of them are on the wrong side. Yeah, we can zoom in, and I guess we see that there are a couple of points in the margin, and even some of them, this guy over here is on the wrong side of the decision boundary, okay? But it's fine, we have slack variables, we can pay for it if the overall solution is nicer. Okay, so that is the idea. What happens if we change the hyperparameters? Um, yeah, in my current implementation it doesn't work anymore, I have no idea why, but um, in this case what will happen, I tell you, just the width of the margin will change, right? If I increase the cost for slackness, um, then um, I could increase the margin, and if I make the cost for slackness smaller, then I can make the margin smaller. Now, that's the wrong story. If I increase the cost for the slackness, okay, then I want to uh, avoid slackness by all means, and that kind of means the other one gets larger, or the other way around. I think I'm confused about it now, but this is the end of the lecture anyway. Anyway, in this case, for the linear case, it does not affect the solution. So that's maybe the story here, okay? Next time, we will look at the nonlinear case, and in the nonlinear case, we will see that it will affect the solution. So that might be one solution, and if I change the hyperparameter, we get a very different solution, okay? But that will be next week on Monday. Okay, thank you for your attention, and I see you on Monday.